Our first reading today is from chapter 10 in Mark, starting at verse 32. It, this reading picks up right where last week's reading left off. Um, here, Jesus and the disciples are, are traveling toward Jerusalem. Jesus is teaching his disciples again what it means for him to be the Messiah. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was, going, what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Our gospel reading continues right where Kevin left off. I'll beginning, uh, be picking up at verse 46. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they talked, the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him along the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes this happens. I come up with a sermon title before I've actually written the sermon. And then, by the time I write the sermon, the title's completely wrong. So, as a game, you might see if you can figure out by the time the sermon is over, what is the sermon title? What is it we want Jesus to do for us? I remember a moment when those of us in certain kinds of jobs experienced a little shift in protocol. In my first job after graduating from college, I was administrative assistant in a large new startup healthcare center in Braintree, Massachusetts. 
an HMO in the halcyon days when we thought that model would solve all our health care needs. Since we were a startup, I worked for three different departments at once, internal medicine, pediatrics, and mental health. And those of us who answered the phone in this role had to make the shift from saying, may I help you, to how may I help you? It's just one little word, but it made sense. It was someone calling, and they obviously needed our help in some way, so we were just cutting to the chase, not inflicting an extra level of needless questioning to people whom we have since learned need to convey their needs very quickly and urgently. Researchers have told us in the recent years that patients need to sum up what is wrong with them in the first 18 seconds they have with their doctor. You have 18 seconds. Take longer than that, and your doctor is already several steps down a mental flow chart of diagnostic tools and may already have made what they call an anchoring mistake, a mistake in judgment that affects the rest of the diagnostic process. So saying, how may I help you in a situation like that gives the person at the other end of the phone, a person who is probably already at least somewhat anxious about their well-being, it gives them some power, it gives them some control, at least at the outset, of what may be a situation completely out of their control. Here we are again, continuing right where we left off last week, but also we're completing something, this fascinating, pivotal moment in the Gospel of Mark. With this passage, we are completing a turning point, if that makes any sense to you, and I'll say more about that. We are also watching how people behave when they feel things are completely out of their control. Beginning in chapter 8, Jesus and his followers entered into a time of teaching and travel. After Peter spoke up and made that wonderful acclamation of faith, saying to Jesus, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, Jesus began teaching them exactly what it means to be the Messiah. At the same time, he began leading the disciples on the road to Jerusalem, a fact that is underneath a lot of the tension in these passages. But that fact isn't named aloud until the passage we have just read. In both the teaching and the traveling, Jesus and his friends are walking towards the cross. And this entire section is bookended by two stories. Chapter 8, verse 22, begins with a story of Jesus healing a blind man. And chapter 10, Verse 52 is the end of a story of Jesus healing a blind man. And I think throughout this time, Jesus is doing exactly what you would think he might be doing, helping to bring about sight, sight among his disciples, spiritual sight. That's what we've been doing this entire long journey to Jerusalem. Jesus has been trying to engage in a kind of curing of spiritual blindness for his followers. And his instruction doesn't quite take the first time, or the second time, or even the third time. Jesus has shown them the glory of God and the transfiguration as God commanded his followers, this is my beloved son, listen to him. But the disciples have been doing more talking and fighting than listening. Jesus has told his disciples, the Messiah is one who came not to be served, but to serve. But the disciples keep jockeying for position. Jesus has said again and again, as part of the kingdom, his disciples have to become like little children. But the disciples keep having disputes over who is the greatest. At the beginning of today's passage, with Jerusalem closer than ever, Jesus tries one more time to teach the disciples what it means that he is the Messiah. See, we are going to Jerusalem, he says, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him 
and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Without missing a beat, John and James, brothers, sons of Zebedee, fishermen, walk up to Jesus and say, we need to ask you something. There is just the tiniest hint of hope in a question like that. We might hope that the disciples are ready to go deeper. We might hope that they're ready to really understand what this means. Jesus is Messiah. Maybe they're ready to hear the truth. And with all the love that is in him, all the compassion, Jesus asked them a question. What is it you want for me to do? What is it we want Jesus to do for us? As for the disciples, they ask, may we sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory? Can we be really, really special when we get to the good part, the part with palaces and thrones and stuff? Can we have thrones, thrones right next to your throne? You almost have to laugh. Could they display any more vividly that they have no idea what Jesus is talking about? Or perhaps that they know exactly what Jesus is talking about, and they're doing that very human thing of pushing it away as hard as they can. They are stuck with old ideas of what it means to be in the inner circle of a man with power. A professor offering commentary on this passage this week compares it to a beloved childhood board game. Anyone know shoots and ladders? Players roll the dice and advance around the board, hoping to land on a ladder and quickly ascend toward the finish while avoiding the chutes, which send the player sliding back towards a lower level. It's a child's game, but it is a metaphor for life. And sometimes for Christian discipleship. A moment of revelation and insight is followed by a tragic slide into darkness and failure. Here, it's a struggle for understanding to see Jesus as he is, not as we would have him be, not as we would remake him or distort him for our own purposes. Flashes of insight come, but a pattern of corrupting self-interest returns. Two steps forward, one step back. What is it we want Jesus to do for us? For John and James, Jesus patiently replies, maybe impatiently, there are no stage directions. He might be mad. We're not sure. We have his words. You do not know what you are asking. Their request shows a disconnect from the present situation that is maybe understandable, but nevertheless frustrating. Two steps forward, one step back. Who can help them understand how to follow Jesus. Enter Bartimaeus. He is blind. He is a beggar. His story is the closing bookend of this big passage, the traveling and teaching passage. And while he cannot see Jesus, he can very much hear him. And he can very much speak to Jesus, which is to say, yell, which he commences doing right away a lot, loudly, so loudly and insistently that his friends are hushing him and shushing him and trying to get him to calm down, go away, be quiet, be docile, but he will not. He insists. He yells. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What is it you want Jesus to do for you? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe you'd like to say it with me. Say it with Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let's do it again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Okay, be Bartimaeus. Yell as loud as you can. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. Right where he is. He stops. And with all the love that is in him, all the compassion, he says, what do you want me to do for you? 
and the blind, begging, insistent, yelling, throwing off his cloak, springing up and running, Bartimaeus replies, my teacher, let me see again. What a contrast, this answer to Jesus' question. No requests for power, no requests for glory, just heal me. Could it be that the first step in following Jesus is we submit ourselves for healing? What is it you would like Jesus to do for you? Taking Bartimaeus as our mentor, we might be in urgent touch with our need, not simply our wants, not the things we'd like, but our deepest need, the things for which we would trade nearly everything if God would make it right, right now. We might then let nothing stand in the way of our approaching God for that purpose. We might holler, we might embarrass the people around us, we might knock with all our might on heaven's door because it is that important. We might spring up, spring up. We might not be used to springing up, might take some effort, but we might spring up and throw off anything that's holding us back. We might spring up and run and approach God, getting as close as we can to Jesus. And we might say with all our hearts, with tears streaming down our faces, my teacher, help me. What is it that you want Jesus to do for you? And then when our healing has begun, well, we might just never look back. Never. Instead, we might bind our lives over to following him, as Bartimaeus does. He doesn't go back and sit by the side of the road. He joins Jesus on the way. With hearts that ache for all the gratitude that is in them, crying out, thanks be to God. With voices crying to the heavens, amen.